Let's get organized here. All right. So it is Tuesday. It is November the 10th. This is basic math. I can do this. And uh, yeah, so we're back on the regular, regularly scheduled program. Last week was a little bit different because I did the all day charity live stream, which was amazing. I actually had a good time. I did not break down and cry while I was writing in front of the entire internet watching me create a rough draft live on the screen, which is not how I like to do things, but I will stretch myself for a good cause. And, uh, and then we also had some fantastic guests that, um, you guys came and hang out and we had really good conversations and we gave away some stuff and it was fantastic. And the best part of it was that we raised $577, uh, for, uh, international justice mission to fight trafficking and slavery and exploitation. So that is awesome. So thank you guys so much. Really, really appreciate that. All right. And so this week, sorry, get my, getting my notes back up here. Uh, this week, um, I'm actually doing a topic that was by request. So again, uh, please feel free to send your uh, requests my direction. Uh, I'm happy to work it in, uh, into the theme rotation, uh, because that's the whole point of having a theme rotation. Uh, but we're going to talk about rewards and reinforcement and how we can use those to manage our writing and our career development and making decisions. And I think this is especially important this month because it's NaNoWriMo and a lot of people are working on a specific word count. And then when you hit that slog, you're like, in your first week, you're like, oh yeah, I got this. And usually about two, two and a half weeks in, you're just kind of like, oh, there's a lot of words here. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so this is, this is where we start thinking about, okay, how can I motivate myself? How can I keep going? And there's so much mythology out there about using rewards. And, uh, yeah, surprise, this is my day job. So I'm happy to talk about it, um, and talk about ways to do it better than what a lot of the pop culture recommendations are out there that have walked by the science, but not really taken the time to get to know it. So, all right. Um, oh yeah. Seekers, uh, Seekers saying six, as uh, your classic, your classic NaNoWriMo number is 1,667 words a day is how many words a day you need to, at the end of the month have reached your 50,000 words. Uh, so that is, you know, it's perfectly doable, but you're going to at some point, you know, start to feel that a little bit. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So some days are great. Some days are, as Seeker says, not fun. So um, yeah, and I'm, I'm in daily chat with some, you know, creative friends, which is fantastic and really good for motivation and everything. But yeah, we, like, I think this week is when we all kind of went, okay, it's getting harder now and <laughs> that's that's pretty normal so um <laughs> right so natalie says twenty thousand words is consistently like being hit in the face of the door I, i'm i'm just gonna assume that i'm interpreting this in the same way that it, you know it's me is like you start and you're like okay this is great i've got momentum i've got momentum ow okay it's like you know marathon runners talk about hitting the wall at around 20 miles okay 20 miles twenty thousand words it's the same thing <laughs> i think there you go so okay but let's talk about this because again i i think a lot of the stuff that's out there in pop culture is close to your it, it's it's close to the science but it's not as close as it could be and we can do better so <laughs> grace is waving yes hi grace and yes it is hard yeah it's i'm not gonna lie there are there are days i'm like why 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 do i think this is fun and that's actually one of the things we're going to talk about uh here so um we preface this by saying we are specifically talking today just about rewards and reinforcement for things we want to do, like writing. Um, oh, oh my gosh, we're no longer having, I just saw in the chat, the uh, um, the chat is still running our fundraiser. So, hey, while you're more than welcome to uh, continue to donate, I'm gonna hop over and turn that off because that's not supposed to be running right now. So I'm sorry, give me just one second. Make sure that gets 
shut down because we don't need that chat going on. Give me one second. So sorry. I got so excited. All right. Okay. We're going to hope that we're going to hope that works. But again, thank you so much for <laughs> those fantastic donations because that was awesome. Okay, <laughs> now, quick, before you talk into another 10 hour method, I did not bring enough caffeine to do another 10 hours right now. So sorry, guys, definitely getting out earlier today. All right. Uh, so yeah, uh, we are talking specifically about uh, rewards and reinforcement for things that we already have an interest in doing in this case, writing, we are not going to be talking about how to motivate ourselves to do things we don't want to do, like accounting and taxes. Okay, um, so that is a perfectly valid topic, and it is. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff we could talk about there, but it is too much to talk about in one session. So we are just talking about rewards and reinforcement for the things that we want to be doing, that are occasionally we're not motivated to do them, or we hit that part where darn it, this is not the fun part of the book <laughs> or, or whatever the case might be. So, okay. So first of all, let's talk about rewards versus reinforcement, because typically we tend to use those words interchangeably in common parlance. Scientifically, they're very different things. And if you, if you know the difference between them, you can get yourself out of a lot of holes. You don't even have to get into those holes to start with. Um, and it's where I see breakdowns happen a lot when people are talking about, well, rewards don't work. Y yeah, rewards don't work. Well, they say, well, reinforcement doesn't work. Oh no, reinforcement does work. If it's not working, it's not reinforcement. Like let's, <laughs> most people will give me that, huh? Face at that point, but let's, let's break this down for just a little bit. Reinforcement by definition changes behavior. If it is not changing behavior, it is not reinforcement. So the phrase reinforcement doesn't work to change behavior is inherent. Like it, it, it's, it's a nonsense statement because it's like saying up can't be up. Okay. That is the definition of reinforcement. What it does mean is what I have thought was reinforcement is not changing behavior. Therefore it is not reinforcement. So it is a litmus test for if I have chosen good reinforcement, because if I've chosen good reinforcement, it's changing behavior. If it's not changing behavior, it doesn't matter what I call it. It's not reinforcing. Okay. So I'm going to be uh, a little pedantic about the difference uh, between rewards and reinforcement, uh, because in practical outcome, there's a huge difference. And so much of what oh, rewards don't work. Uh, and, you know, and this is, this is, uh, this is not a good system. And all of these things that you hear are actually rooted in poor understanding of rewards versus reinforcement. So I'll just start there and I'm going to keep this pretty user friendly. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to, this is not going to be uh, a really uh, high end technical lecture and there will not be a quiz at the end. But honestly, thinking about the difference between rewards and reinforcement can solve a lot of problems. So I just put that out there. So, um, oh, nice. Yes. So Natalie's pointing out in the chat. Uh, impact is for reinforcement versus intent is for reward. If I, if I, um, if I am, okay, let's, let's turn this around to me because I know my preferences. <laughs> okay. So if, if, uh, somebody wants to reward me for a job well done and they buy me Super Bowl tickets, I'm going to be like, yay. I mean, that's really expensive. You should appreciate the intent, but I'm not probably going to get super excited about that. And I'm probably not going to change my behavior to get those Super Bowl tickets because it's just not a thing that floats my boat. But there are other people who will change their behavior a lot <laughs> to get those Super Bowl tickets. So for me, you intended it as a, as, as a reward. That's nice. I can maybe even recognize that intent, but it didn't actually motivate a behavior change in me. So it's not reinforcing. So if that, if that makes sense, great. If it doesn't forget that example, just go with the actual definitions. Yeah, and Natalie's like, but if you pay for my dog sports entry fees, yeah. So they, if, I, if I take that for that uh, Super Bowl ticket and I exchange it for cash on my local street corner, <laughs> now I have something that is more reinforcing because I can apply it toward things that I actually do find uh, more motivating. So, okay. Um, anyway, why, where all this is going is because there is a tremendous amount of very confusing um, 
pop culture science out there on why rewards and positive reinforcement don't work. Um, one of the ones that I hear about a lot, fortunately less commonly today, but it was really big a few years ago, is Alfie Cohn's book, Punished by Rewards, which is an entire book on why reinforcement is a terrible idea and why it doesn't work. As a professional, I read his book and I'm like, this is just a series of case studies and incredibly poorly done reinforcement. <laughs> like, like, um, like if you'd talked to anybody in behaviorism for less than 10 minutes, like we could have solved all of this, <laughs> but, but then you wouldn't have gotten a whole book out of it. So I guess I see the, the motivation there. Um, and it's, what's great is at the end of the book, he talks about, okay, so we know rewards don't work. We know positive reinforcement doesn't work. What does work? Well, what if you let the people if you let the learners choose something that's important to them and then they can they can have that when they do well um but but and they're choosing what what actually matters to them <laughs> i'm looking i'm holding this book like in this last chapter and i'm like yes <laughs> like, good that's page one of how to reinforce um so like he, he made an entire career out of misunderstanding how behavior works and then recommending what behavior people do. So anyway, all of that, what I'm trying to say is that because there's so much out there and I've seen so many people reference that book or reference other things that do that book uh, or that, that, that use that book or, or like that. And, um, and it's just, it just bogs the whole thing down. So what I, the short version is when you see, okay, you're a writer, um, you're working on your nano, you're getting your word count. Here are suggested rewards to use as you work through your calendar. It is just that. They are suggested rewards, okay? They are not necessarily reinforcing. Quite a lot of those suggested rewards would actually slow down my own progress. Um, so please, 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 like, we're gonna we're gonna walk through how to do this properly. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I'm really like trying to hold back and not just go off on my on my technical soapbox here, but I I want this to be very um, very uh, user friendly. But darn it, like these are these are basic things that frustrate me when I see them confused. So one of the big problems that uh, that we get into trouble with when we're trying to use rewards in this kind of situation is the problem of intrinsic versus external. Uh, reinforcement. And so if it's uh, intrinsic reinforcement, it's internal reinforcement, I'm enjoying doing it. That enjoyment is the reinforcement for doing this activity. And that's ideal. If you can get that, like, problem solved. <laughs> like, okay, so um, if you are a runner, and you hit that runner's high, and it feels good, and you keep going, great. I don't know what that's like, but I'm told it exists. Okay. So, um, so that's it. When I'm writing and when I'm in the flow and it, everything, the words are just coming and I like the story and everything's working well, that, that is its own reward, right? That is its own reinforcement. That's going to keep me going because it is inherently reinforcing. Unfortunately, not all of life is inherently reinforcing and not even all of writing is inherently reinforcing. Um, but it's important to know the difference. Now, let me start with this. If you don't get intrinsic reinforcement, if you don't, if you don't get that internal satisfaction from writing, why are you doing it? And I'll just throw that out there. Like there's a lot of... <laughs> There's a lot of people who write because they feel like they should write. And that's, okay, you know what? There's a lot of hobbies. There are a lot of hobbies that you can get better results with faster returns on your time and be less frustrated. So if you truly don't enjoy writing, don't write, okay? I mean, probably if you're watching this video or, or hanging out on this podcast or, or whatever, um, you know, you're... Your, your name is probably not Stephen King. And so you, you can probably uh, have another profession other than writing. And so if you don't enjoy it, don't do it. Okay. Like art is supposed to be good for you. <laughs> so, oh, yes. So Grace is, <laughs> Grace has got where I'm there. And she says, I enjoy having written. That is actually the quote um, from which the name of this show, I guess, technically to write and have written comes from. Um, 
and which, and I, oh, darn, I'm not prepared for the quiz. I don't remember who said it, but um, I don't enjoy writing, but I enjoy having written. Okay, that's where most of us are. Um, but I enjoy having written is still getting enjoyment out of the process. And I know that at some point you do hit that flow where it's awesome. Okay, and maybe you're not there today. I feel that, okay, but, um, but at some point there is that flow. But where I'm going is, if you find yourself saying, well, I should do this more than I am, I am enjoying doing this, just take a little assessment, decide, do you really want to do this? Like, is this really your thing? And some days, you know, it's okay to not to be your thing. Sometimes it's not gonna be your thing because a major life issue happened. Um, <laughs> there's the obvious one, like pretty much every creative person I know has had a decline in productivity in 2020. And that's just because of reasons and that's okay. Um, also, I mean, I, I have a number of friends who they experienced a death in their family and they couldn't write for six, 12, 18 months. Then they got back into it. Okay. You know what? That's a major life affecting experience. Those things will affect how your, how your process goes, how your flow goes. I don't, I'm not, I'm not worried about that. All right. I'm just looking at if you really just like the idea of doing some sort of art, but you hate making words, don't do it. <laughs> you can find something that you enjoy. Art is supposed to be good for you. This is supposed to be fun. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Joe, for jumping in with uh, Dorothy Parker. I hate writing. I love having written. I knew, I knew it was a quote from a famous and I just couldn't, couldn't pull that out. Okay. Um, so I should write. So I'm going to write to relieve the pressure of should be writing. Um, that is technically negative reinforcement. So here's your behavior, uh, behavior nerd talk for the moment. Um, negative reinforcement is you are going to do this, uh, behavior to, um, to get rid of the pressure. Okay. Think of it that way. And it's not really how we enjoy living our lives. Um, and, uh, Sorry, let me, let me finish the sentence and then I'll get to the, get to the chat. Uh, so the, it's doing stuff to get rid of pressure is pretty typical adult life, but it's also kind of puts you in con constant survival mode. It's not how we do things that we enjoy. It's not going to produce our best work because we're going to do the minimum necessary to relieve the pressure. We're not going to do the most to get the most out of it. All right. Um, and so one that, uh, a really common example for negative reinforcement and one that I'm actually seeing a lot um, this year and at this time of year is uh, going home for the holidays and how many people are struggling with, you know, oh, do I, do I travel in 2020? Do I get together with, with family, you know, for Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever? And, um, and how much, you know, I need to, I need to do this because there's, there's going to be so much, you know, uh, so many phone calls and so much pressure and so much guilt trip if I don't do this. And, and I'm like, okay, this is, this is the problem. <laughs> I mean, you, nobody should go home for the holidays to, uh, to escape the pain of not going home for the holidays, right? Like going home for the holidays should be an enjoyable experience. That's the whole point of going home for the holidays. So when we apply that kind of guilt trip, we're, we might get the behavior we want, but we're going to get the minimum commitment. We're not going to get the maximum engagement. So uh, negative reinforcement is not our best bet for approaching this kind of immersive activity. Okay. Okay. So Grace asks, I've heard most people can borrow from expected future satisfaction to use as present motivation. Is this true? Because this doesn't seem to happen that way for me. I'm going to say this has to do with your history of reinforcement. And we're actually going to talk more about this later. But um, if you don't have a reason to believe in that future, uh, future satisfaction, it's extremely hard to borrow on that credit. And um, that has everything to do with how that has worked out in the past. So we will, I did put that in my notes, so we'll get there. But excellent question. Okay. Um, anyway, so where I'm going with this negative reinforcement thing is don't, write a book or do NaNoWriMo or write a story or do whatever, because it's the least painful option. <laughs> You're just guilting yourself into it. Um, you know, oh, I wrote a book because I wouldn't let myself do anything I enjoyed more. You know, that's a terrible, terrible uh, bio, right? Um, there is a place for work ethic. And you've heard me talk a lot about, you know, we don't sit around and wait for the magical story fairy to come down and bop us on the head and 
you know, and we the muse strikes and we just do everything in flow all the time. That's not how that works at all. But if you truly don't get joy out of the process, then Marie Kondo, that thing right out of your life. Like this is this is art. It's cathartic. It's fun. It's good for you. It shouldn't be miserable. So there, <laughs> if you're doing it for the money, there are easier ways to make money. Trust me. Uh, so, but at some point, that internal joy is going to fail. The magical story fairy is not going to come out of the sky. Uh, it's going to be NaNoWriMo day 28 and I'm behind. It, you know, something is going to happen and um, I need to get my nose into the grindstone and, and do this. And that's where having those external reinforcement options can be really, really helpful. Internal reinforcement is always the best. If you have that, if that's available to you in that moment, great. If it's not, then go ahead and use the external reinforcement and it is not a bad thing. It is still reinforcement. Okay. So, um, and sometimes the writing life has components like we enjoy the writing or we enjoy having written, but it comes with things like marketing and accounting and stuff that we don't like, I do not wake up in the morning and be like, ah, oh, I want to get a spreadsheet and do some ads like that never has happened. I <laughs> don't expect it will happen anytime soon. Um, so that doesn't, but external reinforcement can be super powerful to push you through. So we talked when we did the NaNoWriMo talk uh, a few weeks ago, and we talked about the value of having that cute little graph that goes up every day and shows you with dots and bars and pictures how awesome you're doing. That is external reinforcement. It is pixels. It doesn't mean anything, but it's so motivating when I see those pixels going in the right direction. Okay, so external motivation, perfectly valid, can be extremely powerful. So, okay. So this is where we're going to get into finally, <laughs> with all of that lead up, finally get into the how do we do it thing. And where this actually started was somebody sent me this quote uh, about using reinforcement uh uh, this is not specifically about writing, but her question was about using it in writing. And, um, oh shoot, I put the link on where this came from, but I did not write down the name of the author because I was just copy pasting and I missed my, I missed this in my, um, in my notes, but I'll read the quote. You might have noticed that all the rewards I'm recommending aren't all big ones. That's because studies like one in the journal Academy of Management, Learning and Education show that small rewards work even better than larger ones. These little allowances, like checking the last night's score on your favorite sports team, promote motivation, whereas large rewards, like buying an extravagant or expensive gift, have the opposite effect on motivation and performance. And um, that's out of a journal and I'm, uh, it's Academy of Management Learning, or sorry, the Academy of Management Learning had this study um, that I went and looked up because I was like, okay, I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't see why that's the case. So let's go find this. And so I looked it up. And uh, again, I go back to, man, if you guys would just talk to somebody in behaviorism for like just a few minutes, we could save so much time here. <laughs> because again, much of this has to do with false comparisons. Absolutely, in their study, they found that small frequent rewards were more motivating and had produced better reinforcement or better performance were more reinforcing than big extravagant rewards. But I think, but I think as I was looking at it, I'm seeing some false comparisons like small versus big, and they weren't taking into account all the other op uh, factors that were there. So for one thing, if you're doing small rewards, and I'm using the word reward here because that's what they're using and they may or may not be reinforcing. And I don't know, we're just going to talk about what they're doing there. But if I'm using small things, First of all, I've probably chosen them. So they're more likely to be reinforcements than rewards. Okay. Um, but I want to check on that sports scores as their example was. And I want to check in on social media and I want to, uh, you know, I don't know, just picking stuff up. <laughs> Gotta... Guys, I believe in reinforcement. Okay, <laughs> sitting here on my desk. Um, and we, so when I get done with this paragraph, I'm going to have a peanut butter m, m or, you know, whatever the case may be. Those are all things that are going to happen fairly frequently. Okay. I'm going to finish this paragraph and have an m, &M. I'm going to finish this page and check on social media. I'm going to, you know, whatever the case may be, the large rewards, 
if they're talking about an extravagant and expensive reward. Those are not going to happen very often. That's a finish the book, get yourself, you know, the thing, whatever. And so we're not looking at small versus large here. We're also looking at a very, very different rate of reinforcement or how often that's coming in. And I can tell you a higher rate of reinforcement is way more reinforcing than a lower rate of reinforcement. Uh, 30 small things is so much better for reinforcement than one big one because you can build momentum and all kinds of things. So the way I tell my clients this is five pennies is worth more than a nickel. Okay. Yes, technically they're the same batting power, but five pennies. Okay. So much better than a nickel. So, uh, so that's one thing. Um, they don't also don't address competing motivations. So let's say that I'm going to finish my page and have some, uh, peanut butter M&Ms and I have nothing there except, uh, the guilt about the sugar and, and I'll deal with that later. That's future Lara's problem. Okay. <laughs> so I got that. Or if I have a big expensive reward. I'm going to finish this uh, book and I'm going to buy myself a new TV. Okay. I'm just making stuff up here. Okay. A new TV is a significantly different process than eating some M&Ms and it's going to cost significantly more than those M&Ms. And I now have to think, okay, I'm going to buy this TV. I earned this TV, but it's expensive and I'm uncomfortable spending that much money. And those things are going to play into the motivation just as much. So it's not purely a M&Ms versus TV comparison. There's um, uh, other factors, there's, you know, there's other costs to that uh, reward. Uh, and so there's other costs then to my behavior. And Natalie just said what my next point was. She said they're usually delayed after you earn them. Small ones are immediately accessible. I think my next thing was timely delivery. Okay. I finished this page. I get those M&Ms now. They're on my desk right now versus I finish that book. I think about the TV. I finally convince myself to do it. I buy it. It arrives a week later, you know, whatever. So, um, you know, so those are, um, hugely different when we talk about timeliness and reinforcement, uh, delivery half a second, it can be a very significant factor in how much that influences behavior. So yeah, put in the week's difference. That's a lot of half seconds. <laughs> okay, so it's going to make a very big difference in how reinforcing it is. Is it a reward? Probably. Is it reinforcement? I don't know. Okay. Harder to say. And, um, so where I want to pull out some things to, uh, to consider here. So there's the 300 pack, uh, phenomenon that when researchers were first studying and we it's called 300 pecs because they were using uh, pigeons and they would put the pigeons in basically a Skinner box. Um, so the pigeon has a button or a lever and it's got a little feeder and we start with peck the button, get a piece of grain, peck the button, get a piece of grain. Now you have to peck the button twice, get a piece of grain, peck the button three times to get a piece of grain. And you can see where this is going. And they wanted to see, can you teach a pigeon to peck? 300 times for a piece of grain? The answer is yes. Okay. It absolutely happens. It happens for several reasons and it happens with several, um, several pieces of fallout, which are very significant for us applying this in our own lives. Um, the first is the pigeon, which it's very important to note. The pigeon is in a Skinner box. The pigeon has, does not have access to Netflix. The pigeon does not have access to social media. The pigeon does not have access to other books to read. The pigeon is staring at blank walls and a button. And so finally, it's going to peck the button because there's nothing else to do. Whereas if we ask ourselves, I want to peck 300 times before I get any kind of reinforcement, we do have all those other options and those other sources of reinforcement that we're probably going to go uh, invest our time and energy in something that pays out much sooner. So that's an important feature to remember. The other thing is they found out that even in that Skinner box, when researchers did this, the, once the pigeon started pecking, it would just and get those 300 pecks, you know, just go very, very steadily until it finally got to its reinforcement. That was fine. But the delays, you know, if you're doing peck, treat, peck, treat, peck, treat, you're pretty like a little piston. Okay. Your loop's pretty clean there. But when you're doing 300 pecs, you'd get your, get your grain and you would do anything to put off starting that again. We had all kinds of pigeon procrastination going on 
And that's when the pigeons did not have Netflix. <laughs> okay. So you all absolutely uh, see that kind of delay and putting off because it's just so much work to get that single reinforcement um, again. And because it's not about the size, it doesn't matter if they put, make it a big reinforcer either. It's about the rate of reinforcement. The rate of reinforcement is really, really, really important to building that steady, reliable behavior. So um, if you, if you finally, finally knuckle down, I think this is where you see people procrastinate, 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 and then they get started and they just plow through until they hit the deadline or the, the end of the project or whatever. And I think some of that is probably coming out of that. Um, a lot of that is being driven because one, you're just seeing negative reinforcement. Okay. I'm going to do it to relieve the pressure and that they weren't getting inherently reinforced for the project itself. And then two, because all the reinforcement just comes at the end, that's when the pressure is relieved. Okay. So they put off the, the thing until they just can't anymore and then work through till they get to the end. And then they're not going to start the next thing until they can't put it off anymore. <laughs> Natalie's in the chat. Today I learned I am a pigeon. Yes. <laughs> okay. There is so much good and so much embarrassment that comes out of behavior. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, a friend told me that she has a hard time using reinforcement for herself when she's working on a project because she says, I'll think, okay, I, I want, I'll buy myself this album or you know, whatever the case may be, um, when I get X done, but then I just buy it anyway. <laughs> so I don't have to work toward it. And, um, so I, I, I laughed at the time and I'm like, you kind of have to be the adult in the, in the room. Okay. <laughs> like there's nobody to adult for you. You have to do that for you. But that actually ties into this as well. Um, that what that's telling me several things. If I were to look at that from a training perspective, um, you know, okay, let's analyze what's actually going on behaviorally here. She's her, she's telling me that her rate of reinforcement is way too low. Okay. She's not, she doesn't have any faith that she will get the reinforcement by working for it. She's going to have to work too long to get the thing that she wants. So she's going to try to short circuit the system. Um, and she's telling me that her reliability, her history of reinforcement is suspect. Um, and my guess is there's somewhere, oh, you'll get, you know, you'll get this or I'll get this for myself. This is, doesn't mean somebody else did this to you. We do this to ourselves all the freaking time, which is, oh, I'll do this and then I'll get that. Well, now it's time to get that, but okay. And we cheat. And then later we don't believe ourselves. And so we cheat. <laughs> okay. So, um, we've got nobody to blame, but ourselves for that. Um, so I'm going to talk about this because again, I see this happen a lot in, um, I catch myself doing it to myself, which I should know better. And I see it in my friends all the time. I'm just going to say, be an honest banker. If you promise yourself, you know, if you get to this point, you will get X. Then when you get to that point, you should get X. Okay. And I don't care if, uh, I don't care if you want to raise the bar, if you want to move, if you want to move the finish line, don't lie to yourself. Okay. Um, don't downplay an achievement if you actually worked toward it. Okay. Oh, wow. I, I'm just, I'm going to do this when I get 2000 words today. I'm going to, you know, this would be great. Well, I got to 2000 words. Okay. You know what? That's not really a lot. Like a lot of people do that all the time. So I probably should get to 3000 before. I, no. No, that's cheating. Okay. That is lying to yourself. That's being a jerk. Uh, would you do that to your friend? Would you yank, would you yank the rug out? Would you move the finish line for your friend? Then do not do that to yourself because what you're doing there is you're creating that distrust in your own reinforcement system and you're ruining your own reinforcement history. And that's going to come back for you. Um, and I have a friend who I will speak about very obliquely because, uh, did not ask her if I could share her story, but this, if I, I'm not going to identify her, but she did a huge, amazing thing. A massive project took more than a year to finish this, this awesome thing. And, um, 
she got done and she's like, hooray, this is awesome, but I'm not really counting it done until X happens. You know, we wrap, we wrap it and, and this happens. I'm like, okay, that's cool. That makes sense. Cause that's going to be like the final, you know, the, the cherry on the top that'll, you know, signify the official closure of this project. Great. And then the X happened and she's like, okay, yeah, yeah, that was cool. But, but really Y needs to happen before. Okay. All right. Why? Why? Good. Is it a thing? And, um, and then she's like, okay, okay, that was good. That was good. But, but really I'm not going to actually count it as done until, and I, you know, and she listed another thing and I said, okay, hold on. What's actually going on here? Because I've heard you move the finish line three times in my own hearing. So what's actually, why, why don't you let yourself finish this? And she kind of stopped and she's like, oh, that's a really good question. It's like, okay, that's like, you work that out on your own. I don't need to, <laughs> I don't need to work that out for you, but, but why won't you let you yourself have this win? Okay. So, and I know, I absolutely know that she would not have yanked the finish line out from under me. Right. So don't do that to your yourself either. Let yourself believe in your own reliability. Okay. Be a, be a, be an honest banker. <laughs> Here we go. So, um, yeah. So I think if you're, if you're, unable to hold out for the reinforcement. There might be several things going on there, but one of them is definitely make sure that your reinforcement is coming frequently enough that you believe you can reach it and make sure that you aren't in the habit of taking away from yourself once you've actually earned it. So that's all that I can address over the internet. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so let's do, okay. Rate of reinforcement I mentioned earlier is, you know, how often are those reinforcers actually coming, not necessarily rewards, but actual reinforcers. How often are they coming for your behavior? If you are getting, if you're in that flow, and if you're getting that internal reinforcement at the time, you are constantly being reinforced because you're in the, you're in the zone and it's awesome. And rating reinforcement takes care of itself. Another reason why it is so awesome to be in flow. Um, if you're relying on external reinforcement, you actually have to think about how often your rate of reinforcement, you know, how often your reinforcement is coming. You have to think about that rate of reinforcement. If you are in the flow, do not interrupt the flow to impose external reinforcement. And this is something that, again, I think probably um, was part of the problem. If we go back to Cohen's book and he's describing, um, oh gosh, it's been forever since I read it, but he was describing um, trying to teach kids to prefer certain kinds of markers. So when they would draw with certain kinds of markers, uh, the researchers would, you know, give the kids, you know, stickers or external uh, rewards. Um, but then ultimately the kids actually preferred another kind of marker. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, of course, like reading this is like this is so obvious to me. You know, I'm a kid, I'm having a great time drawing a picture and you keep stopping me drawing my picture to give me stuff that's not related to my picture. But when I draw these other set of markers, you leave me alone and I get to do the thing that I wanted to do. Like, ob this is obvious, right? Like, don't interrupt the flow. That's, at, we call that punishment, all right? So um, if you've got that internal reinforcement going, just just wallow in it and glory in it. And that's fine, that's there. But when you need that external reinforcement, by all means, give it to yourself, okay? Because nobody should have to do taxes without some form of reinforcement. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. I put on my really good motivating music and I get my chocolate and that's how I do my accounting. Um, which actually, uh, December 1st, make sure you're here because we're gonna have Chris Morris, who is fantastic, here to help us with our accounting. And, um, bring your chocolate. It's fine. <laughs> and, but Chris is great. And I asked him months ago to come and do this in December with us. So please, uh, please be here for that. So, um, but when you need that external reinforcement, make sure that you do give yourself a fairly high rate. Now, how quickly that needs to come, how often you need to get that, what those intervals need to be. That's incredibly subjective. And if it's, dealing with making ads or if it's you know, working out my taxes, those need to come pretty darn fast. And if it's something like, um, I really need to get this, uh, this visual ad designed, or I need to write back cover copy. Those, you know, that's, those are things I enjoy more. I'm going to get 
you know, further without having to wrestle with the chocolate bar. So, um, just that's one of those know yourself. That's the difference between rewards and reinforcement. Know what actually changes your behavior and do it at the interval that you need. Okay. So yeah, you, but this all comes down to is you need to be aware of what is reinforcing to you at that time. That can completely change from week to week, from day to day, from minute to minute. And so you just need to be aware of what is reinforcing at that time. And if you're thinking, wow, like Laura, you say this stuff is really simple, but it sounds really complicated. Yes, it is really simple and really complicated. And that's why people like me have a job. So <laughs> it's great. Um, so, okay. Um, so when I say, I, know, I mentioned earlier, a lot of times you'll get into uh, writing sites or NaNoWriMo inspirational uh, talks or whatever, and they will give a list of suggestions for uh, reinforcement, for positive reinforcement. They usually call them rewards, whatever. I'm going to say, okay, now here's my, instead of this list of, list of rewards, suggested rewards, I'm going to say, here's my list of suggestions for positive reinforcement. First item on the list, it's literally anything. <laughs> Okay. They did, I'm going to modify that a little bit. That is legal and safe. Okay. Don't get in trouble and make me your excuse. But if, um, it, it can be anything that motivates you to do the thing. It can be anything that helps you to change your behavior. So don't limit yourself to the traditional, you know, oh, I'll get to the end of the chapter and I'll buy myself a new album or I'll get to the end of the book and I'll, you know, buy myself a new outfit or, you know, whatever stuff that I, I see listed. Um, these can be little things. These can be very tiny things that happen a lot. And, um, you know, okay, I'm going to finish this paragraph and I'm going to put on my favorite song, like small things. It's totally fine. Uh, positive reinforcement is incredibly personal. It's incredibly variable. It will change from moment to moment. And that is fine. Make sure you give yourself Oh, hello dog. Make sure you give yourself um, both small and larger reinforcers. Uh, just make sure that your smaller ones are coming frequently enough to be useful. Um, and then if you want to use some larger ones to celebrate, more power to you. There's nothing wrong with larger ones. The problem is only using large ones spaced out. Just so again, my, my, my underscore here is going to be keep the rate of reinforcement high. Rate of reinforcement is your big thing to look at um, as you're working on this. So, okay. Um, if you remember a few months back and I'll let you, if anybody has questions or comments to throw in the chat, now is the time, but I'm going to give you the sneak preview now. Um, if you remember how, um, some time back we had marketing homework, um, back before November. So like three years ago in 2020 time, um, then, uh, and so we, we had uh, several, several layers of marketing homework that we worked through next week. We're going to take that and we're going to put it into spreadsheets. So um, writers, traditionally, um, spreadsheets are a uh, are an enemy. Like in, if this were a uh, an RPG, that would be like a, an enemy class. Um, so writers really just, we don't do spreadsheets. We just, we don't do spreadsheets. But spreadsheets can actually be incredibly helpful as we're arranging our marketing. They're super nice for things like accounting and taxes and working out your ads and all sorts of things. And we probably want to be at least passingly familiar with spreadsheets before we see Chris uh, about accounting in December. So next week, um, our very own seeker is going to be our guest here and walking us through spreadsheets and how you, as a writer who works with words, can meet a spreadsheet and still come out on the other side. So, okay. And now I'm going to check the chat here. One second. Oh, okay. This is a good question. Hold on. Okay. So the question is, um, advice on how to transition from reinforcement back to the next loop of work. Novelty seeking is really reinforcing for me. So I use social media or forum checking a lot and will work for it. 
Uh, you know, congratulations, we'll get you a membership card and a t-shirt. I think that's all of us. Um, but then I struggle to and transition back. I can use a timer, but the task interruption at the end feels intensely aversive and that builds frustration quickly, but I wasn't done. I feel that. So is that, should that be saved for an end of session reinforcement? So this is, um, this is a really good, really, really good question because, um, well, this is me too. <laughs> so here's what I do. Um, like if I go to give myself a social media break, which, um, <laughs> has been, has been interesting this year because, uh, you're kind of taking a, kind of taking a chance on it. My guess is this going to be reinforcing or is this going to be very punishing when I get there? Um, but if I give myself a social, a social media break, I will frequently use my notifications as my built in, uh, uh, limitation to, to that. So instead of I'm going to go to Instagram and I'm going to scroll through every freaking new post on Instagram, which I could be there for quite a while. Um, it might be something like I'm going to go, uh, I'll use Facebook cause they have a really obvious, uh, notification system. I'm going to go to Facebook. I have seven notifications. I'm going to check those seven things and then I'm going to be done and I'll come back and get back to work again, um, on my next chapter or whatever the uh, the loop is. Um, I'm kind of with you. Uh, if, if for people who can use a timer and it doesn't feel interrupting or aversive, um, timers are great for that sort of thing. For me, I'm basically using the social media app itself as my timer. Okay. I have seven notifications. I'm going to go through those seven. Now I'm done. By the time I get the next chapter done, I will have a new set of notifications to go through. Um, so that's one option to do it. Um, the other is you could say, okay, I'm going to check this thread on the forum and then I'll come back and I'll check the next new thread on the forum. And, you know, again, just use, use the structure of the platform itself to parcel out what is your dose, uh, for this, for this session. Um, and so there's probably a number of ways to do that. I would say just find the one that feels the most natural and sustainable for you. Um, and then, yeah, for your end of session, it's like, we, that's where I get to go to the endless scroll version. <laughs> you know, that's where I go to Instagram or Tumblr or something that's just going to scroll for days and, and constantly reload. Interestingly, there's quite a lot of uh, research and we probably don't have time to go into this in huge detail, um, but there's so much research on social media creating anxiety um, <laughs> like beyond the obvious reasons. Um, but it has to do with things like endless scrolling. So if you use, uh, something like if you go to a forum and you've got a specific thread and it runs until it runs out of posts on that thread and it stops, you have completed it. But if you go to Instagram or Tumblr or any of the ones that just will refresh continuously and you can't get to the bottom, there is no end point and it actually contributes to that constant low grade background radiation that, um, was an issue even before this year. <laughs> and, but it really is a tie with that and anxiety. And so you can actually look at what social media platforms and how people consume that social media and get that tie to, um, to, uh, how anxious they are. So, yeah. And, um, along with that, our, excuse me, our national addiction to instant messaging as opposed to email. And, um, you know, the, the massive generational difference in that and the corresponding difference in anxiety levels, because, uh, you know, there's, there's just, there's just so much interesting reading that's out there on that. And I'm not going to go into that in huge detail, but, um, letting go of instant messaging and, um, letting go, you know, and, and embracing things that don't have a quick turnaround time. You, you are not expected to reply quickly. You don't expect a quick reply. Um, you know, those kinds of things can be really, really good for your brain. So, okay. Um, oh, wow. So these are tools I didn't even know existed. So, um, Natalie saying she uses newsfeed eradicator to cut off access to the newsfeed on desktop and stay focused to limit access to all of Facebook, including notifications for shorter periods of time. There def I knew there's some, um, apps that will, will turn off your notifications. Um, so those are good. Yeah. All the, my, my mobile phone, which is always, always, always with me 
but I have email notifications turned off. I have Facebook notifications turned off. The Facebook app is not installed on my phone. You know, there's a lot of things that I do to protect not only for security reasons, but also just for, um, you know, just peace of mind reasons. If I had email and Facebook notifications on, I would be crazy trying to keep up with that. So, so they're not on. So, okay. So yeah, Grace says, I'm such a rebel that I often go for the reward before I should, because there are literally no consequences. Yes. So yeah, um, there are, there are no consequences except that then you feel guilt about it later. <laughs> um, because you're like, oh, but I cheated. Um, but I would say I'd go back to, as I, my first guess is you're setting your reinforcers too far apart. You don't believe that you can achieve it in a timely manner. So you cheat and, um, give, you know, make it, make it shorter, give yourself smaller rewards more often. Um, I'm going to say reinforcers, but I'm, again, I'm trying to balance between the popular parlance and the, and the thing. So, but give yourself, uh, more opportunities to get it right. And, um, then you'll find that when you trust yourself, you, you have that history of reinforcement and you know that you'll get them. It's much, much easier to put stuff at the end and work away toward it. Cause you know, you will get there and you don't have any reason to jump ahead. So there you go. Um, so I hope that makes sense. So I will, uh, I will, I, I have, I knew someone who would at the end of the, uh, Thanksgiving, I'm sorry, at the end of Halloween, should go out and bulk up on the Halloween candy, you know, buy it, buy all the clearance sales, which I think is like every writer, of course, um, for NaNoWriMo, but she would actually like pull out a bunch of small candies like M&Ms or Skittles or, or little things and put them down the side of her notebook she was doing um, some her initial writing by hand. And then so she would fill in. And then when she reached that candy, she got to eat it. And then she would keep going until she got the candy. And, could eat. and I'm 100% sure that at some times her writing got larger. <laughs> like that is, I'm sure that happened. But it didn't matter. She still got to that point, right? So, and they were all lined up. She could see them right there. She just had to keep going to them. And um, you know what? That's not a bad system. You know, if it works, it's great. And, um, so find, find the one that works for you. And I would say just most people, um, because we as a society are so conditioned to thinking about rewards instead of reinforcement, um, uh, we tend to put things too far out. And we're also as a society, incredibly good at moving the finish line, um, and I know so many friends who will be like, okay, yes, I did this thing. Well, now I shouldn't be proud of the thing. And I probably need to do something else before I can. No, no, no. You did the thing. Okay. Treat yourself like you would treat your friend. So, okay. Um, <laughs> Grace says she doesn't trust herself. Uh, so put the candy down the, down the, down the notebook side or whatever it is that you're doing and then take tape, a little cello tape and put it over the top of them. So that you can't, can't just grab them as they go. You have to consciously make a decision. Honestly, a lot of it is about making, making conscious decisions. My bag of M&Ms has been on, um, here on this desk, um, for several days, but I realized I was hitting them a little bit too hard. Um, so I moved the bag to the far side of the desk, still here. I can still have it when I want it, but because I can't grab it mindlessly because I have to make a conscious decision to reach for it. I was like, stop. Okay. Is this a decision? Which decision do I want to make? I don't, it's fine. I can decide either direction. I just have to make a decision rather than mindlessly grabbing. And, um, and that was enough that I hadn't had M&Ms for several days. And then I'm going to hit them again real darn hard tonight. So that's how that goes. Okay. Yay. Um, <laughs> Natalie's done cereal and a pet tutor or a treat and train for yourself. That is awesome. I have not, I have not done that. I do know someone who put M&Ms in a dispenser, uh, for a child, um, and did uh, variable or varied rates of reinforcement that way. But, um, yeah, you can, I would say if, you know, here's the thing, if it works, it works. And for those of you who don't live in um, the animal <laughs> dog behavior world, um, pet tutors and treat and trains are, uh, either timed or, uh, remote operated treat dispensers. So you can load it up and then drop out, uh, stuff individually. And it is totally legit to put M&Ms in one 
Um, nothing wrong with that. Oh, okay, great. So uh, future topic suggestion and request setting up time to write environmental cues and how to keep them salient. That is a great question. So we might talk about that in the future. I will look at that where that could fit in. So um, yeah, so next time spreadsheets. So your homework is to find where you keep your spreadsheets. And that can be if you own Microsoft Office, you have Excel, great, figure out how to open it, don't do anything else with it. If you don't, but you have Google Sheets, or um, I think Open Office is still a thing, but it's Open Office, I'm, I have trouble recommending wholeheartedly. So Google Sheets might be your best non Microsoft option, something like that, whatever you've got that is your spreadsheet option. Um, bring it because we will do live work, I think next week. So it'd be fun. And then after that, we have our create in special NaNoWriMo edition. And then after that, we have Chris Morris, uh, who is a CPA who will be talking us through how to do accounting without crying, which is a good topic. So, <laughs> oh, yay, spreadsheets. I love spreadsheets. Okay, Natalie, you're excused. This is for people who don't love spreadsheets, but you can come anyway. But um, <laughs> yeah, this is, this is for people who are like, oh, the spreadsheet will eat me because that's where I started with spreadsheets. Honestly, I think that's where most writers start with spreadsheets, but, but they are incredibly good for tracking so many things, or they're really, really good for things that aren't even to do with numbers, but they just organize really well. And I found myself using spreadsheets like routinely for that. And that's crazy, but yeah. Okay. So that is it. That's what I have for this week. Um, thank you guys so much for coming and hanging out. And yeah, felt absolutely free to send me more ideas. Um, and oh, also specifically, I'm going to say for the learn with me's, um, tell me what you guys want to learn about, you know, tell me, you know, help me help me to track down the things that you're interested in. I want to find experts that are actually useful to you guys. So yes, <laughs> yes. So yeah, Natalie's like, it has lines that say you did the thing upward green light. It does great jobs at making beautiful, motivating graphs. This is so true. So true. And I will do so many things for a motivating graph. So yeah. Um, but then also they're really good for like, oh, I have all these words I need to write down and keep track of, and I couldn't draw lots of columns or keep rewriting them, or I can throw them in a spreadsheet and make them all magically do it themselves. It's great. Okay. Okay, so that is it. Thank you guys a, ma a lot. Um, thank you guys a much. That was me. Yeah, that was good. I, I, I word, I word professionally. So um, that is what I've got. And I will see you all next Tuesday for spreadsheets. Take care.